Hello, this is the 15th lecture in the Stream Ecology series from SMCM during the summer of 2020. This lecture covers the major fish families in Maryland, although many of the fish families we see in Maryland are very similar or the same as uh, fish families across uh, states in the United States. So you'll see these occur in many, many locations. The image here is actually the only endemic species, meaning the only endemic, the only species found exclusively in the state of Maryland. It is, is the Maryland darter. Unfortunately, as far as we can tell, the Maryland darter is now extinct. So the only endemic Maryland had, as far as fish is concerned, is now uh, lost to us, sadly. Although it means you have one less uh, fish species to identify if you have an ID guide for Maryland. All right, so there's 23 fish families, freshwater fish families, that you must know if you're in Maryland. If you're considering estuarine areas, then you would have more. And if you're thinking about uh, the marine side, you have quite a few more to think about. But for the purposes of this course, we're focused on freshwater. So by the end of this lecture, I'm hopeful that you'll be able to identify any of the fish that you collect just by eye to family if you were in Maryland, and then you'll get to see some of the adaptations these fish use to living in stream habitats. The most primitive fish family found in Maryland is this one. This fish is an extraordinarily unusual. This is an adult animal. There's also larvae. These are the Petromyzontidae, or the lampreys. We actually have a couple of species of lampreys in the state of Maryland, but they're all pretty similar in appearance. They have no jaws. They just have this disc with teeth in it at the one end. They always have seven gill pores. There's no paired fins along the body, so they look very worm-like. They're soft and no scales, just skin. They don't have any bony rays in the fins, so they're just soft sort of raised regions, but they are fins. And they have this protocircal tail, which is this tail that is very similar and comes to a fine tip uh, at the very end of it. Now, I'm not showing you a larvae here. They look different. But most of these features would be true. They would not actually have any jaws, and they would not have eyes. Uh, but other than that, they would be similar to this in some ways. Another group of primitive fish in Maryland are these guys, the Acupenseridae. The Acupenseridae are sturgeon. These were at one time very commercially important in Maryland. All the remaining uh, populations are now protected by law. And it's illegal to possess them. Their numbers are very, very low, but a appear to potentially be increasing. They can get enormous in body size, easily as large as a man, quite a bit larger than a full-grown adult male uh, human at times. They are found in freshwater. Usually though, when they're in freshwater uh, entirely, it's because they're breeding, although things like the shorthead sturgeon can live for long periods in freshwater. These are extremely rare. Uh, today, they do occasionally still uh, get caught, but not very often. They have uh, bony scoots on the side of their body, which when they're smaller can be quite sharp and actually can cut your hands. They have fleshy skin. They have this weird sort of barbels tucked underneath their nose. Uh, they're just an unusual animal. They also have a heterocircle tail, which is that the spine extends into the upper lobe of the, of the caudal fin, the tail fin there. And the lower lobe does not have the spine in it. So it creates one side of the tail, which is, looks super beefy and one side, which looks a little bit skinnier. These are bottom feeders. They feed on a lot of different things, worms, mollusks, small fish, dead animals, dead fish. They probably pick up some dead plant material while they're doing all that. They are uh, pretty benign in the sense that they're, they sort of just swim around cruising around. And if uh, you actually ran into them, you would, you would find they uh, would take things like a, a piece of dead bait, but then they would put up quite a bit of fight uh, if, if you could actually catch them. Again, not recommending you do that. It's illegal under federal rules, so you'll be you'll have some federal agencies come down upon you if that occurs. Another primitive fish family we find in Maryland are the gars or the Lepiostidae. These are characterized by having extremely thick square scales which don't overlap along the body. They have extremely long snouts that are filled with lots of little sharp pointy teeth. Be careful if you handle them. They can bite and they can leave nice little marks on your hand. They're pretty they're not aggressive, but if you're handling them with a hook and line, this can occur. Uh, they often found in weedy areas, they're ambush predators, and they have these large hemi homocircle tails, which means that the, the uh, uh, spine extends just into the tip 
of the tail and it l mostly looks uniform as you go across it except you can see that there's a little fleshy bit at the very top of it. Another group of fish which is extremely common in Maryland or, and it was probably more common even in the past are these guys, the eels. There's only one species of eel, that's Anguillidae. These are the American eel. Uh, the, the American eel used to be more common. It has suffered a number of, of problems related to its populations, including disease, habitat loss, uh, overfishing, uh, climate change is probably affecting it. There's probably a pollution. There's probably a number of other things which are occurring, which we don't understand about it. So the numbers have declined. It still remains one of the more abundant fish families that we find in streams in Maryland. These are omnivores. They eat everything and anything. They love other fish. They eat other fish at, as fast as they can find them, but they're quite happy to eat dead animals too. And it's very easy to catch them. They're primarily nocturnal. You can put out bait at night and they will happily find it. They are very uh, scent oriented. So nice stinky bait is things that they like to eat. So say uh, old meat is stuff that they really like. They can get in and out of little holes very easily. They don't really have scales. They're, they're a very slimy fish and they can, they can wiggle in through crevices. Unlike the lamprey, they have jaws. They come in in a, a vast range of sizes. Some of them can be as large as a man's arm or even larger. They do have one set of paired fins right up behind the gills. They only have one gill slit instead of the many gill slits that you see in a lamprey. They do have these isocircle tails, which are tails that have a uniform shape and pattern all the way down. You can see it ends in just a terminus down there, and there's lots of fin rays supporting it. Uh, and these fish are often brown, golden, sort of green colors. Uh, again, very, very common throughout Maryland streams. Throw a hot dog in the river at night, you'll see them come out to go eat it. Another primitive member of the Maryland fish family community, these are the bowfins, Amiadae. Uh, there's only one species currently, although that may change. The bowfin is a very unusual looking fin fish. It's a, another stocky animal. It looks very blunt, uh, sort of bullet headed. It has a big flat bone under the jaw. It has cool little nostrils that have these long extensions. It has uh, fins uh, that, that are located in a couple of very obvious locations. One extremely long dorsal fin, which runs down the back. Pectoral fins immediately behind the gills. Pelvic fins about halfway between the, the gills and the anal fin, and then an anal fin immediately behind the vent. They have a hemi homeocircle tail, which means that again, they have that slightly elongated lobe uh, to the caudal fin uh, at the very, very tip. So the caudal fin's not truly symmetrical, but it's close to it. And then many of them have this, this very dark spot at the base of, or at the tail itself. During the breeding season, they turn beautiful fluorescent green colors. They are also very easy to spot in slow moving waters because they will protect their offspring and you'll see large balls of, of bowfin swimming around with a, a adult protecting them. These are frequently confused for snakeheads. Snakeheads are a far more advanced group of fishes, although they share similar ecology and uh, areas and even some of the same breeding uh, behaviors, which is interesting. Another major group are the herrings, Clupeidae. Clupeids are very, very flat bodied, often extremely shiny, primarily a marine group, but we have a number that migrate into Maryland streams during the spring, and there are some freshwater groups that remain there permanently. They have these very large scales, semicircular scales that fall off relatively easily. They look like somebody took a fish and squished it between two boards. They have really big mouths uh, without teeth in them. So they're primarily filter feeders. They also have this weird membrane that covers part of their eye. You can feel it with your finger when you pass over it. They only have one dorsal fin. Their entire body is soft, except for this very obvious place on the underside of their, their body called the, the saw belly, which looks like a saw blade uh, bit. It has little crenulations along it and it's pretty tough. Uh, and you can actually cut yourself on it if you're not careful. Uh, but these guys are large schooling fish, so if you catch one, you probably catch a bunch at the same time. 
Again, generally we find these as a marine group, and they are common in Maryland streams in the spring when they're migrating in. But during the rest of the year, there's only a couple of species that actually will occur uh, in the, the freshwaters themselves permanently. One of those members would be gizzard shad. Oh, this is one that people are often very familiar with. These are catfish, Telluridae. Catfishes have a couple of very obvious features. One is they have lots of barbels, whiskers, some people call them, at the front of the body. You can see them on the top and on the bottom of the head there. They do not have scales. They are very fleshy, all right? They often have huge spines at the base of the pectoral and the dorsal fin. In one group of these, in the mad toms, uh, they produce a very potent toxin, which is extremely painful, having been stung by them myself. They don't, uh, they're not aggressive. It's not like they come after you when you go into a stream, but if you do pick them up and handle them and you're not careful, like I was doing, and they poke you, you'll know. Uh, it, it will certainly alert you to that. They have a, a very large uh, adipose fins, these thick, uh, fins behind the dorsal fin that don't have any fin rays in them, uh, located uh, between the dorsal and the caudal fin. Some can be quite a bit larger than even the one you see here. They do have homocircular tails, uh, and that be, meaning that the, the caudal fin is uh, symmetrical top and bottom. Common group of fish, again, another one that people interact with a lot, also nocturnal very frequently omnivorous, but also uh, with a bent towards carnivorism, or, uh, carnivory, very happily eating macroinverts, but also other fish when they can fit them in their mouth. Uh, this is one that people are often very familiar with. This is the salmonid, right? The, the classic salmon. The ones that we have in Maryland uh, are often called trout. Uh, that's fine if, as long as you understand that trout covers a range of different groups of salmonids. Uh, we have brook trout, which in Europe would be called brook char. Uh, but in any case, we have introduced other species as well. We have rainbow trout and brown trout. Brown trout are from Europe. Rainbow trout are from the West Coast and don't actually are not native here. But our brook trout, um, many of them are, are state threatened uh, because the populations are endemic to small streams uh, and they receive protections as a result of that. This is a very classic body that all their fins are soft. These are very high speed bodies made for swimming in very high speed environments uh, like streams for long periods of time. You'll often find them in headwaters. They have a small adipose fin, unlike the large adipose fin you saw before. Their head is very bullet-like, and they have very, very small scales to slightly larger scales, uh, depending on the species, but they are always scaled on the body, uh, which you can see if you hold them up. The bodies are often pretty hefty, and that's because of all the muscles in there that help them actually move through the water. This is an unusual fish. I know this picture isn't great. It's not great because this fish is not particularly well studied. So our friends, the trout perch or Procopsidae. Trout perch are unusual. They share a lot of features with very advanced groups and they share a number of primitive features with less advanced groups. They have a very flattened uh, head and body. So they are clearly a ventrally or a, a uh, benthically oriented fish. So they swim near through the bottom. Apparently they can burrow as well. They're often relatively small, the size of what people would call a minnow, something about the size of your hand at most. Fins are usually soft, but the first rays are, are very hard actually in the dorsal fin, and they do have a small adipose fin uh, like the trouts and like the catfish. They are well scaled along the body as well. Very unusual looking animal. It's not easy to confuse with anything else. Another major group, this is one of the most important groups of fishes in North America for us. This is the suckers or catastomidae. Catastomids are characterized by having big fleshy lips. Very, very, very frequently, the ventral side is completely flat to help them uh, remain up against the bottom of streams or rivers. So they are very benthically oriented. Their body is often uh, covered in very soft fins. They are pretty beefy frequently, so there's a lot of muscle mass in there, quite powerful. They are sometimes caught for food. They uh, have one dorsal fin, no adipose fin, and they often have very, very large scales which overlap along the body. This is the group that actually is a minnow or cyprinid, cyprinidae. 
Just to be clear, when people say that they're using minnows for bait or they're catching minnows, they often mean a variety of small fish. They actually don't mean this group. But you will know now that Cyprinidae is actually a group, the minnows are actually a group of fish, uh, and that that's a proper name. It's like calling all, all insects bugs, when in fact that's just one group of insects. Cyprinids come in a variety of sizes. Some of the largest have evolved to be large carnivorous animals, but many of them tend to be as small or smaller than your hand. And they eat a variety of different things. There's all sorts of different um, feeding uh, behaviors and patterns within them. They're very, very important fish around the world because they are found throughout the freshwater systems. Some of the early studies on the effects of stream fish on the ecology of streams have demonstrated that cyprinids have really strong impacts on those. All the fins are soft. They have small bony jaws as opposed to those big fleshy jaws you saw, but they only have one dorsal fin, so in that way they do look like suckers. Scales can be really variable, though they do have them. Some have very small ones, some have much larger ones. If you see a fish with a black rind running down the side of the body, you have no idea what it is. That's almost certainly a cyprinid. IDing it down to species, that's going to be more troublesome. Ah, another common one here. These are the isocids or the pikes and pickerels. The isocidae. These are ambush hunters, more advanced ambush hunters. They have very large mouths. You can't even appreciate it here in this picture. Obviously, that mouth is long, but it extends all the way back. Uh, they are very good at what they do. They curl their bodies into very sharp S's and then lunge out at prey items, and they eat everything smaller than themselves. They can get quite large in some species, uh, but the number of them remain in the order of uh, 12 to 24 inches. Uh, the pickerels, and we see those in and around many, many streams. These would be sort of the top predator in a stream. They will be relatively rare as a result of that. Probably the only predator that they would have would be large birds, uh, and they will therefore uh, behave uh, uh, very cautiously around shadows. You'll see this if you try to approach them. They're very weary to sh or wary uh, when they're out uh, to strike at lures or bait when they think that there's a predator nearby. So if you're trying to catch these, be careful. Um, and again, they're fairly rare. Uh, it takes a little bit of effort to find them uh, in some places. Dorsal and anal fin are both located almost immediately underneath each other. That gives them a good extra little bit of spring when they fly forward. They do have a bunch of small scales along their body, which you can just see here in the picture. And of course, these are very torpedo shaped and very, very pointy at the one end. Often very, very large teeth. So if, you're, uh, if you have them on a hook and line, be careful as you remove the hook. This is actually a group very closely related to the Asasids. These are the mud minnows. We've actually talked about this in the class. These are Umbridae. There's only one species we really deal with, which is the mud minnow or the eastern mud minnow. Again, the dorsal and anal fins are very close together, but you can see that the dorsal fin's a little bigger than the anal fin. Pretty blunt body here, big rounded fins, uh, not, clearly not this aggressive active predator that you see in the, in the prior picture. These fish are highly adapted to living in very, very low oxygen environments. You will find them in some of the worst conditions in streams, uh, and they will be quite happy, doing quite well. Uh, so they're able to e exploit habitat that many other species struggle with. And as a result, uh, they will be found especially in sort of backwaters uh, or along uh, muddy areas uh, where other species have hard time, say, uh, extracting oxygen. Another common species, many people have actually owned a, this group and kept it in a fish tank before. These are the live bearers, the Bocilidae, the, the uh, guppy family, I guess is the way I would describe it. And what we have is a mosquito fish. This is a female. Males have a very long uh, anal fin, uh, which they use for reproduction. These guys have a very, very strongly upturned superior mouth. They are often pretty small, like on the order of maybe 25 millimeters. The males can be mature at just, a, at just let's say, 10 millimeter-ish uh, long, so pretty tiny. The dorsal fin uh, origin starts just behind the anal fin. You can see that here. Uh, and these uh, often have black spots or dark markings along their body, sort of like freckles. No two individuals necessarily are the same. This is another group that looks a lot like the Posilidae's, and these are related to them. These are the killifish, Fundulidae, 
Fundulids are very common in estuaries. There are a few species in fresh water. They are generally long and skinny. The origin of the dorsal fin here is anterior of the anal fin, which means it starts before the anal fin does. So you can see it starts just before that, although again, they're very close together. Very strongly upturned mouths. So these are very surfacely oriented animals. If you've kept these in fish tanks before, there's a number of fundulids which might be kept in the aquarium. You'll see that they, they sit right under the water. Like the difference between the top of their head and the water is really just the meniscus of the water. They're right up against the surface. They feed very heavily on things like terrestrial insects or insects that get entrapped in the surface of the water. Another group very similar in shape and appearance to the fundulids is this. These are the sheep's heads. Cyprinodontidae, another common group in estuaries that does occasionally get found in fresh waters. They have tricuspid teeth, a superior mouth, pretty beefy compared to what you just saw, right? The body is pretty bulky in compared to that. The uh, dorsal fin starts well in front of the anal fin, all right? And these guys are uh, also a little more flattened along the side of the body. Again, usually find these closer to the estuary. We don't often find them as frequently in freshwater systems in Maryland. Ah, now this is a very cool fish. This is the only member of its genus and family. This is the pirate, per or the pirate perch. Uh, they are unusual and characterized by one thing, which is that the anus is immediately under the gills. Okay, so the anus is very close to the mouth, very strange organism. They are often found in weedy banks and they have this dark color and there's usually a dark band running through their eye. No other fish has an anus this far forward on the head. Very, very cool adaptation. It's not entirely clear to me why that adaptation exists. It would certainly be worth um, trying to understand that. The only thing I've ever seen on that was because the animal in the uh, can remain in cover and poop uh, without exposing its whole body. Um, but that to me seems like a pretty limited advantage of that. It'd be very interesting to understand why the, the anus has migrated so far forward on the body. Very, very interesting fish. Very cool looking too. Again, not anything else like it. Ah, a classic fish here. This is the stickleback. Um, there's a number of stickleback. The most common one uh, in freshwater, uh, Gasteriostidae, is uh, the brook stickleback, which is pictured here, or the five spine stickleback because it has five spines before the dorsal fin. There's also the three spine stickleback, which I'll let you guess how many spines it has. These guys tend to be very small, say uh, no bigger uh, than your pinky finger. Uh, often they're even quite a bit smaller than that, maybe only two thirds as long as your pinky finger. They have a caudal peduncle, which is this bony tail bit down here. It's very, very narrow. Um, it runs out into this long uh, fin. The body from about the halfway point is almost identically symmetrical all the way back, which is really, really cool. And they have some really sharp spines on the lower portions of the body. Lots of cool studies have been done on uh, sticklebacks. There's some trade-off between having longer spines protect you from fish predators and making you slightly slower so you're more uh, likely to be eaten by dragonfly larvae. Whereas if you have very short spines, you're able to, to avoid dragonfly larvae fairly easily, but then fish have no problem sucking you down. So some really interesting and cool stuff related to them and stream ecology. We find these throughout streams with good amounts of vegetation. They feed on lots of small inverts. Uh, and they are, of, like I said, a small fish, so you can expect them to be on the diets of many, many other organisms. This is a very advanced group of fish. These are our sculpins, cotidae. The sculpins are characterized by having two very obvious dorsal fins, one and two. Uh, the dorsal fins are all soft, however, okay? They have pelvic fins down below, two pelvic fins down below like many other fish, but the pelvic fins are inserted uh, right underneath uh, the pectorals and right near to the gills, and they're not fused, which I know seems like a weird thing for me to say right now, but the, the comparison is to a goby, which actually they are fused in, and we do actually have quite a few gobies in and around the area. 
heads of these guys are often really big like they look monstrous on top of these things it looks like a little body pushing a big head around that's exactly right these guys have really big heads they engulf anything smaller than themselves and they're happy to eat inverts fish anything that, that comes along find these in riffles they take on uh, males i should say take on beautifully dark black uh, like a jet black color during the springtime when they're breeding and if you lift over up enough rocks you'll find a male guarding a bunch of eggs he'll sit there and fan and protect the eggs very very large anal fins uh, which are is about the same size as a second dorsal fin not too many species of these mostly a marine group but we do have uh, a few members that are freshwater this is an unusual group this is a very this is another classic bait fish these are the silver size of therinidae uh, there are actually two dorsal fins there's a first dorsal fin which the fish usually keeps folded down and most students miss and call it a minnow because only, they think it only has one dorsal fin but if you look there's actually two of them very very clearly streamlined to live at the very surface of the water you can see even the head is flattened to allow that uh, upturned mouth very long skinny body nice long anal fin here to provide stability uh, and clearly built for speed and chasing after things that are landing on the surface of the water like fish like uh, uh, terrestrial insects another species commonly found in freshwater systems in maryland and this is frequently confused with the uh, uh, sculpins is these guys the darters which are part of the percidae group percids are perch if you have fished for yellow perch or walleye you've actually fished for an oversized darter which is exactly what they are uh, perch have a couple of very important features one is they do have two dorsal fins but the first dorsal fin is all spines it's very sharp and if you poke it even on these small guys you'll feel the little spines poking you the second one is soft however uh, so when they get attacked they'll throw up that first dorsal fin to help protect themselves pelvic fins and pectoral fins are located very close together uh, the important thing the difference here is that pelvic fins on darters tend to be much larger than they are on uh, the sculpins the heads are not nearly so wide as you see on sculpins although this one is definitely sort of bullet shaped you can also see that there's a quite a bit of color on some of these some of the perkids are very very attractively colored greens and these sort of turquoise colors are very common especially around us we actually don't have very many species but this is one of the most specious groups in north america very very cool species if you want to see some diversity of north american fish type in darters north america you'll see all sorts of really beautiful examples of darters ah these are the true basses we see these in maryland for sure moronidae the first dorsal fin is very sharp very spiny the second dorsal fin is generally soft although there may be a spine at the beginning of it uh, these are very laterally compressed they're flattened side to side they are therefore relatively tall fish very triangular in appearance you can see that here uh, they have spines on a number of different locations pretty tough fish to try to handle so be careful when you're playing with them they are uh, ambush predators um, and they are also active hunters so they can go out and cruise around but they will also uh, sit near cover and then and then chase out of things to attack other fish again mostly a marine group we know these very well from things like striped bass but a number of them move in or live in fresh water their whole lives um, so moronidae is, is definitely not uncommon in our area for sure Oh, these are often called basses, but these are not, in fact, true basses. These are actually sunfish, Centrarchidae. This particular one is called a largemouth bass. It's not a true bass. A way, the way you can tell that is, although it looks like it has two dorsal fins, the dorsal fins are connected up here instead of being separate, although the first dorsal fin is pretty sharp and the second portion is pretty soft, so pretty similar to those uh, the basses you just saw. They are not nearly so laterally compressed as what you just saw. Those fish that we just looked at, the true basses, really look like somebody took the, the fish and kept squeezing and squeezing and squeezing it until their hands almost came together. These guys tend to be much bulkier. We find them in many, 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 many systems because they have been moved around and stocked. So uh, largemouth bass and smallmouth bass, which are centrarchids, are almost ubiquitous across the United States, although they weren't uh, before the arrival of Europeans. These fish also are the classic sunfish that we think of that we let kids fish for, bluegills, pumpkin seeds, uh, 
red ears, long ears. There's many, many species, a number of very, very attractive fish. Uh, if you are interested in looking at, again, some attractive North American native fish, type in uh, sunfishes, United States, uh, and you'll see lots of different species there. All right, so that covers the fish. I know that this lecture is a little bit shorter, which is all right with me. And then coming up, we're going to talk about amphibians, reptiles, and birds.